Yeah. How you doing, man? What's happening, buddy? Not much. Doing interviews. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out here. Hold on. I gotta, let me see something here. All right. Where are me, you at? I'm in uh, your old stomping grounds, Los Angeles. Oh, you're in L.A.? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny is uh, I've never met you, but I've seen you play a million times. And uh, where are you at now, Vegas? No, no, I'm in uh, California. I'm near Temecula. Oh, oh yeah. Cool. I like when some people call it Temecola. <laughs> Temecola. <laughs> I'm a little mixed up. Yeah, Temecula, wine country. Yeah, yeah, man. So great to see you and, and great to have you on the show, man. I've been trying that to get room, that room looks like like 60s ish. That's the mid century there, buddy. Yeah. Are you a, 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 a guy into architecture? No, but it just looks really cool. Is that a real is that real or is that a background? That's a background. But uh, one day it'll be real. I keep but it for inspiration. What do you use to do that background? OBS or? No, you can just, uh, with Zoom, you can grab any photo you want and oh. put it put it into the uh, background. Oh, okay. I got to try yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got a cool background. You got drums. <laughs> Those are real, too. That's my kit. Is that a studio in your house? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it's a big house down here. That's why I'm living down here. It's nice, and and the house is a, you know, fairly new, and it's big, and it's quieter. It's quiet till I got here. <laughs> what what is that kid? A Ludwig? No, this kid's a the company I'm with is called Sawtooth. Beautiful drums, and they sound great. Look, that's that's the name of them. Wow, they look beautiful. They are beautiful. They are hickory. And uh, it's a killer sound on them. Actually, every every Tuesday at 4 p.m. L.A. time, I do a live stream from here. And I play to some music and I teach a little bit and tell some stories, the whole the whole thing. And, Is that uh, on Patreon or just like a freebie? No, it's a freebie on Facebook. It's Vinny Apathy Official on Facebook. And every Tuesday I've done a hundred, this one will be 107 shows and people like it, you know, it goes out and after a week it gets a bunch of hits on it and uh, the, the company sponsors it and it's great. And then I answer some questions and stuff and um, it's a good thing. It's a good show. And uh, great, I got a great drum sound too, because I figured out how to tweak it through Facebook, through mixers and stuff. And it's good. What's just, the what's the bass drum size? Twenty four. Yeah, that's a twenty four. I, I just put new head new heads on a whole kit. That's a twenty four, and then there's that bass drum uh, subwoofer mic. Yep. So there's one inside the bass drum, which is a ninety one Shure, a flat mic, and then there's that one that gives it the low end, so you mix them, you can mix them in there. It's cool, cool setup. You know, I've been seeing you play for years and uh, I've been uh, a big fan of your drumming for years. And I had oh, no you. idea. Thank you. Uh, I had no idea that you actually played on some Lennon tracks, man. John Lennon. Yeah. Well, I didn't play any famous tracks, but what I did was uh, the band I was in at the time, and I was like 16 and a half going on 17. Uh, we were managed by the record plant studios in New York City. And we had four horn players, keyboard players. So it was nine piece band. And our good friend was Jimmy Iovine from, uh, from everything. <laughs> yeah. And he uh, brought us into the record plant and they liked uh, Roy, the owner, loved us and signed us to a management deal, gave us a room upstairs on the 10th floor in Manhattan on the record plant to rehearse. It was our own room. Well, we were there. And it was great because it was free. You know, nothing's free in Manhattan. So one night, Jimmy calls, goes, can you guys come down and do hand claps? Go, okay, yeah, sure. No problem. Because they didn't have computers. So we go downstairs, all nine of us. We walk in and we, we see John Lennon. We go, oh my God, it's John Lennon. So then we go in the, 
in the room. We put the headphones on. He's talking to us from the control room. And now you're hearing him talking to you after all these years of hearing him and seeing him. I'm like, oh, shit. So we did hand claps on the song, Whatever Gets You Through the Night. So he was telling us what he wanted, you know. And uh, and then after that, he probably wondered where we came from all of a sudden. You got nine people do hand claps. So we were upstairs. So then uh, a couple of days later, we're rehearsing. He comes in, walk, sits on the step and watches us rehearse and play. We played him a couple of songs. He really liked the band. You know, band was good. It was tight. And uh, and then he used to come out all the time. And we had a pool table up there. He played pool with us, um, smoked some joints with him. And uh, he, he asked us to do, uh, well, actually, he produced the owner's wife, Lori Burton. She was a singer. And we did uh, eight songs with him as producer in the studio. It never was released, but he was the producer. And then he rewrote uh, one song we had. He rewrote the lyrics for us, which is incredible. Incredible. And then he did, uh, we did three, uh, we were on three of his DVDs clips that we shot at the record plant and then he asked us to do a live uh gig at the new york hilton and it was going to be broadcast all over the world on you know tv the whole bit and uh so we did that and we were the that i found out not long ago that was his last live performance wow so you guys backed him live yeah and uh and I had to go to high school the next day. <laughs> you played with a beetle, and then you got to go to high school the next so day. I'd be, I'd be in the class, and the teacher's trying to teach, and they, I'm like, I'm playing. So she's going, wait, wait, who's that drumming? Vincent, stop that drumming. And I would stand up and go, excuse me, did anyone else in this room play with one of the Beatles last night? And I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that is that is just insane to actually play with John Lennon at 17 years old. I mean, right then you just got to. I'll show you. Let me get the magazine. Hang on. All right. I thought it was over there, but it's not. It's somewhere else. There's a magazine that came out about five years ago, Guitar Aficionado, and there's a picture of uh, Lennon and and my band, and uh, they mentioned him, of course, and they mentioned me because I played, went on to play with Sabbath and all that stuff. So. Pretty trippy. Oh, yeah, that is, man. That, I mean, uh, there's only a few people, a handful of people that played with a Beatle, including the Beatles, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, that, was a, that was a trip. I was like, wow. And then how, high school the next day was total contrast, you know? How do you get involved with uh, Derringer after that band? Of course, it breaks up, and then you start to play with Derringer. Uh, I love the Sweet Evil record. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, that's a great. I was listening to it today getting ready, man. Driving Sideways is just such a cool track. That's and, Danny uh, song. Danny oh, Jones. It's great. And then uh, Sitting by the Pool, this podcast was originally called Poolside with Dean Del Rey. And that Sitting by the Pool track, just the lyrics, just sums up Los Angeles, you know? Well, that's what it was about because we were a New York based band and, and we always said, everybody's kind of laid back in LA and they don't like to, you know, do much, too much. Uh, and uh, Rick thought that too. And that's how he wrote those lyrics, you know, but I got involved with Rick because we were at the record plant studios. Jimmy Iovine recorded us. We did about four, maybe five or six tracks. He produced it. And then one day Rick walked in while he was doing something. He goes, who's, who's that? Who's the, who's the drummer? And uh, Jimmy said, that's Vinny Appleseed, Carmine's younger brother. I wasn't really known back then. He went, wow. And then I ran into him a day or two later, and he said, I'm putting a band together. Give me your number. You know? And uh, so I gave my number, and he called. And uh, six months later, he called. And he said he's putting a band together. And, uh, you know, so I told him about, about Danny Johnson. Because I we were in a band together called Axis. Me, Danny, his brother-in-law Jay, we were together before that too, before all this. And uh, so Rick came down, and he liked the band, and he used Danny on guitar, and me, and we we all flew to New York. Jay didn't he didn't want Jay, 
But Jay wound up playing with Foreigner oh. on their first record, putting it together. But he, they could only pay him 50 bucks a week. <laughs> he had to leave, which was ironic, you know. And uh, so uh, that, then we started Derringer. So in that record plant studio was the meeting place. You know, everybody was there. Cheap Trick, Aerosmith, Jay Giles Band. We used to see Bruce Springsteen come off the train and walk him with his guitar on his back into the record plant. We were across the street parking. We go, hey, Bruce, he you doing, dude? It was just Bruce from yeah. New Jersey. And I remember seeing him walking in, you know, when, hey, dude, how you doing? All right, good. He was nobody, you know? And uh, all the people that were there, it was incredible. So that was like a perfect, uh, the right place at the right time, all the time. When, when you get into Derringer, of course, I'm a huge uh, Dan the Green fan. And, uh, you know, the last Led Zeppelin show in the United States was in 77 at Oakland Coliseum. Uh, those two nights, it was Judas Priest, uh, Derringer, Led Zeppelin. Do you remember any of that day? I, I wasn't there. Damn, what happened? Well, we played with Rick for about a year and a half, two years. And Danny and I thought, you know, you know, we're, we're making the same money. You know, we're young and in, in a hurry. Let's put Axis back together and get a deal and do it ourselves. <laughs> and that's what we did. Rick was pissed off. So we left and put the band together. We got a deal on RCA Records produced by Andy Johns, a good record. It's called oh, wow. Axis. Uh, it's a circus world is what it's called. And uh, so I missed that gig. Man, that that's a that's an insane uh, to think about what went down at that gig. You know, that's the famous Peter Grant fight and uh, with the Bill Graham people. And yeah. then, of course, uh, you know, Robert Plant's son dies and uh, they never play the States again. Judas Priest opens. It's pretty wild, you know, to think yeah. about that time. I had wow. Rob Halpert on and he was talking about how uh, they were just finishing the tour and then Priest asked him to play it. And they sat in this hotel for two weeks because they couldn't afford to fly home and then come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's old school rock and roll, right? Just like, where's the money at? Where's the money? We got to make it work. We got to do that gig, you know? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, it's 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 also interesting to think about that time in the 70s with people like Derringer and Rick, uh, Rick uh, Robin Trower and uh you know edgar winter and johnny winter and all these all these guys that were just were massive you know uh you know labels would sign guitar players like that and they would become huge yeah and we we wound up playing with a lot of big bands we played uh um uh, our album came out then we wound up uh we played a gig in a, connecticut it was called the shabu inn <laughs> and we were headlining and the opener was this band called Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. <laughs> and I'm over there going, what the fuck is a heartbreaker? What What kind of name is that? You know, what do I know? Yeah. And uh, I'm from Brooklyn. So uh, that, and then we wound up opening for Boston. When they first started playing, they didn't even know what to do on stage. They used to watch Rick and take cues from Rick. Like he's a, he was a pro, Rick, you know. And we did that. We opened for Aerosmith on a lot of the Rocks tour. Wow. We played with Foghat. We played with 10 years after, I think it was, too. Yeah, and I was like a kid. I was 18, 18, 19 years old going, wow, going to all these places, Chicago. And it was mostly in the States and New, you know, New York, California, Seattle. Whatever. We were all over the place. That, that'd be a weird world for you. Like all of a sudden you're just out touring with huge bands and, uh, you know, going around. Did, did you guys actually have, you know, cause sometimes bands at that level didn't have their own techs and stuff. Were you doing your own roadian and stuff or were ah. you, at, you're at a good level? Oh yeah. I yeah. don't do that. I don't do that shit anymore. Even back then we had two, two techs, you know, and they set everything up and then they tore it down. Yeah. Only one time when I joined Black Sabbath, after a couple of shows, you know, 19, 1980, we're playing the big arenas. We get to the gig and they said, uh, Vinny, your tech didn't show up. My tech was Bill Ward's old tech. So he was 
wasn't happy he was working for me now. He was oh. Bill's mate. So he just went, fuck it, I'm leaving. And he left. And I had to set the drums up in an arena. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so I set the drums up. And then the crew broke them down, threw them in the cases. Then we got somebody out uh, immediately after that. But, yeah. The Mob Rules record, uh, you know, for me, Sabbath is uh, the Dio era. I I just absolutely worship it. I saw the Mob Rules tour, uh, also the Live Evil. And the Mob Rules record, to me, Sign of the Southern Cross, is one of the greatest metal songs of all time. And uh, can you give me a little rundown on that? I, I, I think I heard years ago that you started recording it in a house in Toluca Lake and that, that didn't work. And then you went to the studio record plant to do it. No, no. What we did, we had a rehearsal place in, uh, I think it was, might've been Van Nuys on the edge of Toluca Lake or something, but it was just a studio. I forgot the name of it, but, uh, but we kind of blocked it out for a month, you know? So we'd go in every day, probably around two and we jam and, I would run the cassette player to record the ideas and then we'd listen, we put them together. Uh, and then when we were ready, we went to the record plant studios in LA and recorded the whole album, including the mob rules song, because that was previously recorded for the movie heavy metal. Right. And actually we were on the road for the heaven and hell part of the tour, 1980. And Warner Brothers wanted us to do a song for the movie Heavy Metal. So we had two days off or something. And we went to John Lennon's house where he shot Imagine and all those videos where they walked through the garden and his big dinosaur hedge, hedges cut his dinosaurs, T-Rex and all different uh, dinosaurs. So we pull up there and go, oh, this is cool. And... Uh, but he, he had passed, you know, he was not longer with us at this point. And then they gave us keys to the room. I get the key. I go up to the room. It says, John and Yoko, I have his room. Well, people. But he just died. So I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to stay in here. You know, I should have. It's stupid. Sleep in John Lennon's room, right? Yeah. Could have been the same bed. I don't know. But that was an amazing experience because we recorded and wrote Mob Rules there. Wow. Recorded it. Yeah. And that's what cemented me in the band because now we have a recording under our belt and it came out great. Everybody, including Warner Brothers, was very excited about how the band sounded. A lot of energy. And so at that point, it was like, well, I think I'm in the band now for a while, you know. And, um, and then every... Everywhere you went, you open a closet door. There's all this Beatles swag for them. Wow. Platinum albums and awards and this. Oh my God, look at this. Even the Sabs were impressed. And Ronnie, you know, legends impressed by even bigger legends, you know. So that was quite an experience. I wish we had cameras back then. We didn't really, you know, you didn't have an iPhone or a phone or anything. You had to bring a camera, so. So, so Lennon still had the studio all set up there, even though he had passed. And uh, were people using it? Was it like just a studio up for rent? I think Ringo bought it, bought the house. And oh, the studio God. was up for rent. Wow. Uh, I guess it was up for rent, but we got in there. But, you know, this is a Black Sabbath. So maybe it was just for certain people. Uh, they can rent it out. You know, I'm not sure. That's interesting because when I talked to Rob Halford about the vocals on um, Unleashed in the East, he said he was so jet lagged that the vocals were terrible. So they went to Ringo's house and in one yeah. long pass, he just sang the vocals for the live album there. Yeah, that's probably the same house. So that's a couple just heavy metal masterpieces done in that house. That thing's got some good luck charm there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then then you walk around it and you look in the room. The door open the door. There's the white room where he did Imagine with Yoko. You go, holy shit, man! Look at this. This is insane. <laughs> Absolutely, it's it's wild to think about. I think that Sabbath once Dio's in and you're in there, of course, 
it's just so much more intense and violent, especially with T Tony Ioma. His playing is just so much more radical. And uh, the sound is like really intense. I mean, it's it's so different. When you were in there, uh, do you think that Tony was uh, specifically playing like less bluesy and more radical to up the game of, of the era that it was? Probably. And uh, the other thing is I, I brought something I think I brought more energy to the band. <clears throat> you know, I, I I'm I'm a lot younger than than Bill was, and we also just came off a long tour, so we knew how to play together musically, and the band uh, starting to kick ass once we locked in. So when we started doing this stuff, they never told me don't play anything. So that's a signal for me to go and be me. And I didn't have to try to, <clears throat> excuse me, play like Bill because this is new stuff. <clears throat> but I had to play like Sabbath, make it sound a little darker and, and more mysterious. And uh, th that was my attitude, you know. But I definitely brought some new blood to the band and probably energy. And, and I think, you know, we, I mean, Tony and I got along really well. So, Maybe he it kicked him in the <clears throat> kicked him in the ass a little bit. I don't know. Man, what what, what a record! Uh, also, then later on, of course, when you come back and you guys are doing the Heaven and Hell, I saw that at the Greek. Uh, I recently watched some footage of it again. Uh, I think it was the Radio City Music Hall. Whatever you you're playing on that on that sabbath era is just so intense and, and incredible it's just i mean what was uh what were you looking for like influence wise what were you bringing to it like okay i'm gonna play different with sabbath compared to say derringer how did you you know what is the frame of mind of that well i got in the frame of mind of how how tony and geezer played they they play so tight together you know they sound like a big wall when they play and different kinds of chords than Derringer would play more minory, more odd chords, different solos. And being that we were on the road for so long that I really got into that vibe of how Tony and Giza sound, especially Tony, you know, and there'd be certain ways I would do accents. You know, I wouldn't use the snare so much. I got boom, bap boom. I would bow, 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 bass drum and cymbals and make it a little darker and and not pop out or anything like that. So uh, and then I and then, I, you know, my inf big influence was Bonham, too. And there's some Bonham stuff uh, floating around <laughs> in that album, like Mob Rules. Da, 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 with, da, da, the Mob Rules. Da, da, that stop is on. And that's something I heard Bonham do when I was young, you know, that's a cool stop. Instead of stopping bop, you go brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
you know, uh, other than say, uh, Phil Rudd's drums that are kind of, uh, you know, they don't have the big reverbs and stuff, but right. once we get into that, you start getting into that bigger sound drums and everything got really big. Then it, it, everything got a lot of fakeness to it too. It was like, Hey, let's put the, this, this one unit you could rent, put it on. And it had this reverb kind of thing. And everybody was getting to that. They were triggering the drums. They, <clears throat> and Holy Diver and the DL albums, we never used triggers. Everything was, a, 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 you know, pretty match, natural. And then we did use some effect on the reverb. That was it. But you're right. It got more processed and more, you know, poppy maybe on, on, on this stuff. Not with us, but with a lot of the bands. I got to tell you, I have a cassette tape here. I was at the very <laughs> first uh, Dio Holy Diver show at the Antioch Concert Bar, and I talked to Vivian Campbell about it. Do uh, you remember playing this fucking place, the yeah. Antioch Concert Barn? Matter of fact, I, I just found uh, over the summer, I found boxes of stuff, and I look, and there's a poster for Antioch, California. Wow. It's hanging in my room there with all the records and stuff. And uh, to tickets in advance with for ten dollars <laughs> yeah so that was the first Dio show and it was a warm-up gig so we go Antioch California where the hell is that and you know it's a good warm-up show we thought maybe there'll be a couple of hundred people there you know and we can yeah. warm up because you know we were a new band so we did a sound check we get there we go eat and everything and then by the time showtime comes it's fucking 3,000 people there. Yeah. It's sold out. I'm going, oh, shit. Look at this. So that made us a little bit <clears throat> nervous, you know. So I remember on that show, we, we had a lot of endings. Ronnie likes a lot of elaborate endings, you know, like uh, End of Man of Silver Mountain. Da, 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 so it was hard to remember all this shit. So I remember we, we were fucking all the endings up. <clears throat> we were just, instead of going to the ending, we were like, I'm not sure <clears throat> when the ending's supposed to start. We're all looking at each other. Okay, go one more time when they're very long endings, you know. Then we just fucking ended it, you know. Just, it was too much to remember all that stuff. <clears throat> we, so we did most of it, but. It's so crazy to think that you guys played Antioch Concert Bar. And I was there, and I think that was the first gig they ever had in there, too. They only had a few gigs there. I guess it was just some dude. He had this farm, and he just started you know, had like a big head, like Lita Ford there, uh, somebody else. But there it is, man. Dio, yeah. Holy Diver, out at the fucking barn. It was like going to a barbecue. You know, yeah. We drove up there. We went. Oh, that's nice out here. Okay, cool. You know, we thought, all right, we'll just warm up and we'll play a show and no big deal. They had a barbecue going. It was like laid back. And then come showtime, like I said, the place is fucking packed. When holy shit. Yeah. Oh, man. So that's funny you were there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I got a cassette tape of it also, man, which is crazy. I want to wow. uh, have somebody <laughs> transfer it onto digital just so I can listen to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. What uh, what was the recording process? How how long did it take to record Holy Diver? I can't remember. <clears throat> well, Holy Diver, uh, it didn't take that long. What we did was once the band was together, we went into Sound City in Van Nuys, Killer. Sound City Complex, which was the recording side studios here, and then it was like a U-shaped building, parking lot in the middle, and on this side were rehearsal rooms. So. Well, I guess we, Wendy and Ronnie looked at the studio and Angelo, the engineer, and uh, they liked the studio. So let's rehearse here. It's right across the parking lot. So we went in and they let us do every anything. We we destroyed the place. We kicked holes in the wall. We opened a pinball game so you couldn't lose the ball. <laughs> this is crazy shit. Hey, you want some candy? Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. The candy would fall out. <laughs> Fucking went nuts in that place so we stayed there uh we, we wrote four songs four songs probably took uh three weeks at the most maybe two 
And once once we had four songs, we took everything and walked it across to the studio. We didn't break anything down, you know, like symbols stand with a symbol on it. Just walk. Thing, 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 walk it across. We all did. Ronnie too. He's carrying something and go in the studio and we set up and we recorded it. And then we finished as much as we could on those four songs. Then we went back in the rehearsal room and wrote four more songs and did the same thing. So I think the the whole thing took six weeks. Probably, wow. Wow. From, from writing it, you know. You remember the first time hearing Vivian Campbell play? I mean, that guy's just insane. And the way they got him is crazy. How they found his name in the phone book, tracked him down. Jimmy Bain called him. Hey, you know, his dad. No, no, Jimmy knew him. Jimmy knew him. Oh, yeah. But no, Jimmy he knew him, but he didn't know how to find him. Oh, I don't know. I didn't hear that part. Yeah. Vivian said that, like, his dad's the same name in the phone yeah. book. So they <laughs> went in a phone book and found him in, in, in you know, Dublin, Ireland, and called in the middle of the night drunk. Hey. Yeah. Hey, Viv, this is Jimmy Bang. And that's his father. He woke him up in the middle of the night. So, so his father woke Viv up and said, Viv, there's a drunken Scotsman on the line for you. It's yeah. 2 30 in the morning or something, you know? Jimmy. Yeah. And you remember how, the first time you heard him though play? Cause I mean, he is just incredible. Yeah, actually we didn't, I don't, I don't know if we, I don't remember listening to his band Sweet Savage before he flew in to, to play with us. So um, we were in London, Ronnie and I, and then finally Jimmy arrived and he called Viv. Viv came in the next day and we jammed at uh, a studio there, John Henry Rehearsal Studios. And we heard him, play there and we recorded it on a cassette and we were like wow this guy's smoking and not only shredding but then at one point he did like a chuck berry thing oh, yeah. beep, 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 like a keith richards thing kind of bluesy we went that's cool because a lot of guitar players just trying to go as fast as they can you know blah, 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 all that shit so uh that sold us when we went and listened to the tape later on that night and um uh, yeah so i'm still playing with him and last in line and uh that's another thing. Like he's from Ireland and I'm from Brooklyn <laughs> and we got the same feel. We lock in together. It's like this special thing that the way we play together, like Iomi and Geezer Butler, you know? Oh yeah. Even on the new last in line uh, single. I mean, you can just hear the, you know, the Dio band type of, uh, you know, playing on that, just the guitar playing and the drumming. And yeah. it's just like right there. You're like, oh, well, this this just sounds like something off Holy Diver, you know, the, the tones even. Yeah, yeah. But you know what, Viv, he, at rehearsal and on stage, he plugs into the amp. There's a wah-wah pedal in between. That's it. He uses angle heads, and he just gets that big, crunchy sound. You know, where all these other guys are using racks and pedal boards. And if you watch any of the videos, I don't know if you see the pedal board. There's no pedal board. Here's yeah. a Wawa pedal. Yeah. And he punched right into the amp. And he's using the Holy Diver guitar with us. And it just sounds great. And so we lock in. We jam together. It's just like it was with uh, Dio back in the day in Naomi. We Play, you know, he'll play a riff on. Hey, that's cool, man. Let's try it again. Let's, you know, just really gels together. Him and I. I talked to Vivian quite a bit about his uh, his Porsche addiction. Are you a car guy? Uh, not really. No, never, never was a real car guy. But he no car, some... not a car guy, huh? Nah. Now I bought. You know, first money I got, I bought a house. You know, I bought them when they first came out a Mazda RX-7 because I thought they were cool, the rotary engine. I wish I still have it. That was a cool car. Oh, I that is 52 cool MG. Car. Yeah, 52 MG. And then I had a uh, Lexuses, Elysium and stuff, and I yeah. didn't get in the, the big cars. Did you uh, ever get to see Bonzo play? No. No. I got to see him one time at a Vanilla Fudge concert. Uh I got to see him actually. They opened for the Vanilla Fudge back when they first came over. That's how Bonzo and Carmine became really good friends. And uh, I was like, wow, holy shit. And then my brother gave me the first album. He goes, check it out. Great drumming on this. 
And I've only seen them that one time. That was it. They was supposed to come down when Sabbath were playing. We were playing London and Hammersmith. Uh, we played four nights there. And Tony said, uh, Jimmy Page and uh, Jimmy Page and Bonham were going to come, or Robert Plant and Bonham were going to come down and uh, check out the show. And a week before, or two weeks before, that's when he died. Saying, Shit, Damn. I never met him. I got one of his sticks on the wall. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. What? Who else do you like out there? Like when you were starting, other than your brother and say Bonzo, who were you uh, into? To to you know Bonzo, uh, uh, Mitch Mitchell. Oh yeah. Ian Pace, Billy Cobham, Buddy Rich, guys like that. You know, and, and all those drummers, what they have in common is they're all lead drummers. They 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 don't play on top of the song. They're in the song. They're pushing the band. They're doing fills. The fills are part of the song. So I grew up, and my brother, and I grew up listening to this going, yeah, that's the way it should be, you know. I mean, you listen to Zeppelin records, the drums, the parts of the drums are a unique part of the song. So, you know, I grew up with that in mind. That's why uh, on Mob Rules, there's a lot of, you know, ass kicking going on. And then Holy Diver, there's a lot of fills. And both bands never told me not to play. You know, like uh, Ronnie never said, don't play over my vocal line, you know, because I fucking played all over his vocal line. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he would he would be inspired and go crazy. Then I would be inspired by him. And it was just a big machine, you know. So uh, and Tony and Giza never told me, don't don't play, you know, that, you know, or on the records or anything. So it was really a cool thing for me you know not to be told and they trust what i do and they like it so out of the out of the holy diver and last in line which one do you like better out of those two it's really tough to choose for me but which one do you feel i like holy diver it was just such a classic it was a magic time and and all that and uh and last in line album has uh you know some some songs that like we rock and then uh, the last in line brilliant song and like I speed at night, just a total burner. Killer. Burner, you know. Um, but Holy Diver, I think every song is just solid, you know. And we were just having fun. We didn't sit there and go, well, let's try to make a classic album. We were just having a lot of fun playing together, destroying Sound City. And then uh, there was no real stress. And we didn't know that this album was going to be, it's 40 years this year that it came out so we didn't know we were making a, an amazing album you know we thought well we thought the same way we thought of Antioch there'd probably be a couple hundred people here <laughs> yeah. laugh. so this this album just keeps kicking ass went double platinum last year you know crazy I know Vivian had uh you know his troubles with Wendy and and that whole thing and you you played with Dio all the way to the end um, were you kind of bummed once he was gone? And oh, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Ronnie told me, you know, I'm gonna get, we're gonna get rid of it. What? Why? Why? You know, I was. Why are you gonna do that? You know, um, it was a, it was a money thing. You know, yep. we were promised a lot of stuff, a lot of uh, percentages, and this and this and this and this, and, this. and it never really materialized. Um, and I kind of had my separate deal with Ronnie and Wendy had, with a contract. So that's what happened. Viv was questioning it and, que you know, hey, what what's going on? You know, And it just got to be uh, uh, a thing where they didn't like that. And they thought, well, anybody could be replaced, which is not true. Yeah. Sorry, that's not true. And they got Craig Goldie in there. And that Craig Goldie was in a band rough cut that Wendy managed. So it was convenient for and easy for him to come in, you know, but it's not true that in certain bands, yeah, you could replace everybody, you know, wh whoever you want, but certain bands, you can't, you know, imagine Zeppelin uh, replacing Jimmy Page with Eddie, yeah. somebody else. Or yeah. Robert Plant. Yeah. Just, there's a magic there with that, that chemistry, you know? So 
So that's yep. what happened. So I was kind of bummed. And then, okay, we'll carry on with Craig. And then the music, you know, we started to go downhill a little bit, you know. It's not Craig's fault, but it was the, you know, Ronnie was producing it and we brought keyboards in more. And uh, we started off as a, a fucking guitar band on fire, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, you know, also that goes back to, uh, the era started changing again. The era started changing. Well, you know, jumps big. We got to get some keyboards and, yeah. uh, you know, let's soften up the sound and get some songs on the radio. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Interesting time. You start chasing that and then you lose your, your core following and your core sound. And then right. it's, yeah. Yeah. When you put together uh, Last in Line, the uh, group now, you got the third record coming out, Jericho. Um, what was the singing auditions like for that? Was Andrew just picked right away or were you looking at a bunch of guys? Well, the way we started was uh, Vivian called me. He spoke to Jimmy and he said, hey, I just spoke to Jimmy. You want to jam together? I'm in town um, in L.A. I said, yeah, that'd be fun. So we got together in the studio and we started playing all the whole, the whole the Dio stuff, trying to remember it, you know, especially Viv with the solos, you know, you're trying to remember his solos. and sh So that's the way it started. Then it was so much fun. We said, let's do it again. And I said, my friend Andy's in town. I've worked with Andy with George Lynch on a tour a long time ago. Right. And he knows the stuff. So let me call him. And he came down. And he knew everything. And when we played, we went, holy shit, it's a powerhouse. It sounds great with him, you know, singing this stuff. So we decided uh, maybe we should start a band, you know. And then uh, Viv's friend, Steve Strange, you know, he just passed last year. He was a big uh, uh, agent in England and the U.S., really big. Everybody knew Steve. And he loved the band. So he's booked us some gigs we did a bunch of gigs in europe then he got us a record deal with frontiers records so now when we had the time we got together and started writing just like deal the way we did it in holy divers so we did an audition it just came together which is cool you know we didn't do it like uh you know trying to get a name singer and it looks good on paper kind of thing you know so this is like l natural every came together and then uh and then we did the first uh, record, and then Jimmy passed. He died. And we auditioned a couple of bass players. And uh, and then Phil came down. We know Phil forever. And Phil comes from the same era. And, he, you know, we all hung out together at one point during the 80s. So Phil was easy to uh, bring in and play with. And he plays, you know, similar kind of style to Jimmy, a little bit more busy than than jimmy played so he fit in great so it's a good team yeah now. yeah phil's great man he uh i had him on the show and had no idea that like he basically him and and jimmy started an early version of the firm which is crazy yeah he did i didn't know that <laughs> yeah that's fucking wild man he's playing with jimmy you know yeah I love it. I love it. Yeah, so the new, cool. their new Just record. So you know, I got to get another interview at once. Yeah. Got about yeah. We're out of here. Uh, new record comes out. What's the date the new record comes out? March 31st. Jericho. And are you guys yeah. going to be touring it or anything? We're going out in April for some dates. And then we're going out in September. And in between that, Div's gone with Leopard, you know? Right. So uh, I'm going to be doing it. I do this thing in Europe. I've done three tours there. And it was called The Mob Rules. And I played basically all the stuff from Mob Rules and some old Sabbath, a couple of Dio songs. And I did like 25 dates on one tour and went back three. I've done three tours all over Europe and, and South America. I've done twice. And uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I said, you know what? And it's fun. It's fun to play that stuff. It's low stress. We're not trying to sell albums or not. None of that. It's just like, a good night of music so it's called sabbath night so i'll be out doing that i got a kick-ass band on the east coast and one on the west coast and uh I'll play all the stuff that i'm on and some old stuff too which is fun wow that's pretty damn cool yeah yeah it's cool and i call it you can call it a tribute plus i'm the plus 
<laughs> yeah. one, one guy that was in the band, you know, that's still doing it. I mean, Sabbath, nobody's, Ozzy retired, nobody's going to play from Sabbath again, probably. Live. Man, isn't that crazy to think about? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, uh, you know, he, he's he's right. You know, the traveling sucks. Oh, terrible. And he's traveling nicely. <laughs> yeah. The traveling, uh, traveling does suck. You got you to be strong, you know, and then play these shows and, and this and that. But now he's retiring. All right, we lost Ozzy and, you know, Tony and Giza are not going to. Uh, Giza's retired pretty much. And Tony, he's still probably doing stuff in the studio. He's got a nice studio in his house and uh, that. So I'll be the only one that was had a link to that, you know. And, uh, and it's fun to do, you know. It's fun to play this stuff. So I'm going to be doing some dates with that too. So call Sabbath nights. You remember where you were when uh, you heard Ronnie died? Uh, well, we were in the hospital with him. Wendy called and said, you better come to the hospital because uh, it's not looking good. I went, oh, God. So we went to the hospital and there were a whole bunch of people there. We're all like a party. We're in his room and Ronnie's just out of it. You know, he's on morphine. He's just, eyes closed he's like unconscious no no no, shit and then um at one point the doctors said okay you guys everybody's got to leave we got to do some work and then you can come back in okay so i went up to ronnie i mean he was unconscious and his eyes were closed i touched him i said ron we'll be back in five minutes uh 15 20 minutes and all of a sudden his eyes opened and he looked at me for about 30 seconds like everything was normal and then i closed his eyes again and went back holy shit i got chills wow yeah it's like he knew i was there and uh so he was basically like that and then uh the next day wendy called and said he passed oh no shit damn damn because we thought we you know we were scheduled to go back out on the road that was he died in may and and 2010 and we finished the year before and uh he was getting treatment you know and he even wanted to get together with me and geezer and him at a rehearsal place maybe like february march start singing a little bit this the tour wasn't until july and that never happened you know, he wanted to do that to, to get back into shape. And his his voice, you know, he sounded a little bit raspy, but we thought it's Ronnie. Yeah, you know, he's gonna sing and two days he'll be like normal. A day he'll be normal. Yeah. You know? And that's not what happened. He just didn't turn out that way. So we never got together with him. Um and then uh you know, next thing they had to bring him to the hospital. So Damn. Terrible. Damn. So man. sad. Yeah. Yeah. The worst part was there was the three of us. I've never experienced this. Tony Keezer and, and me. And we went up to the casket. It's an open casket. And you're looking and going, I mean, this it's freaky because you're a band and there's one guy's laying in the box. Oh man. We normally would have been rehearsing. It was in Burbank too. And it was like we rehearsed in Burbank. And that was freakier than losing a family member almost too, where it's a different feeling. You know, this was like a band's a band, you know, it's a unit. Yeah. And we, three of us standing there, just feeling inside so sad. Oh man. I couldn't even imagine. I mean, like the last time you were with him other than the hospital was on stage on the heaven and hell tour. So then there you are. It's just like, Oh and that last oh. tour, he was pretty, he, he was sick, right? Yeah, he, he was hurting, yeah. yeah. He didn't complain much to me, but he would complain, tell Geezer, you know, you know I think it's gas. And, you know, then he, then he said one time, I think it's, I got cancer. And Geezer was like, no, 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 Ron, you just go see the doctor and sort it out, you know, all that stuff. So, but he went out, gave his 110% as much as he could. Oh, he time. sounded incredible when I saw him. Oh. Yeah, yeah he loved he loved uh, doing that stuff, loved singing and, and the fans and the whole things. 
And the funny thing is when I joined Sabbath, I went out, I went down to meet Tony Iommi in a hotel, 1980. They said, uh, you want to meet Tony? Yeah. So I went and we, got, we hit it off. And he had my album I did with my band Axis, which is Danny Johnson. And he goes, this is good. We like it. Like it. And then we hit it off. Come down to rehearsal tomorrow. I'll we'll go down there. I meet Ronnie and Jeff Nichols and Geezer. They go, what do you want to play? And I wasn't a big Sabbath fan. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. What are we playing? I heard Neon Nights on the radio. Yeah. Like a week before I heard it, I went, wow, that new singer is like amazing. You know, because I wasn't a Ronnie follower either. I, you know, I heard him on Man of Silver Mountain, but not Rainbow. I, I wasn't following Rainbow. So I knew Neon Knights only had one break in it. So it's easy for the drums. So I said, Neon Knights. So we played it. And that was the first song I played with Ronnie. The last show we ever did, that was the last song I played with Ronnie. Wow. 30 wow. something years later. First song, whoop, last song. It was like the end of the, the closure of the chapter, the book. Yeah, that's about that, ironic, you know, freaky. That's a wild story, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the show. Congrats on the new record coming out and uh, the Thank tour you. coming up. And uh, I just wanted to tell you, man, I've been a big fan of your playing. It's just unbelievable how great you are back there on the oh, kit. Thank you. And uh, as as uh, as many people love you and everything, I still feel that you're completely underrated. I'm just like, this guy is a god out there, man, of just <laughs> metal drumming. And the, the, it's mostly the feel, man. Your feel is yeah. incredible. And also, you were right on time today. I'm like, yep, see, he's got great timing on interviews <laughs> and behind the kit. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that's one thing, you know, you could practice, same with guitar. You could practice technique and, and different exercises and same thing on the drums. But the feel, it's got to yeah. come from inside, you know. And you can't teach, I mean, you could, you could teach it a little bit, like don't, you know, it's gotta be locked in, man, you know, right in tempo and things that work, things that don't work. It's hard to teach that, you know, it's gotta come from within. And I, I learned a lot of that too, playing with Iomi, he played so behind the beat, you know, like when we played the song Black Sabbath, there's almost no tempo. <laughs> go, boom, 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 bah. Stop, boom, 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 boom. It wasn't right in. Yeah. You know, same thing if you listen to Heaven and Hell, that was Bill Ward. On the album, they go, da, 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 boom, da, 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 zoom, boom, 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 boom. It slows down. Yeah. The, yeah. And that's the three of them, three Birmingham guys that they lock in and they, they play as one. They all slow down. To get I that. love it. I love it. You gotta, you know, hear that stuff, and you go, "Wow, that's cool." Well, that's you can just feel it. You can feel it when you're in the audience too. It's just it just grabs you, and you're just like, "It's." There's yeah. a lot of drummers out there that are technically, uh, you know, skilled, but they're too much like a metronome. They just don't, right. you know, they just don't have that swing, that feel that groove, you know, it's just like, boom, pop, boom, pop, boom. They're like, I'm perfectly in time. It's like, yeah, but there's no fucking heart and soul there. That's right. You know what it is too? If you listen to the snare drum, the guy's hitting the snare drum. Sometimes you hear him playing the snare drum is exactly the same. Every hit. What? What? Like you just said, whereas I don't hit like that. You know, bah, there's some grace notes that goes like this, you know, same thing with uh, my brother and Bonham, you know, we didn't hit like, bah, bah. It's, it's just there's no feel in that you know no heart in that so uh that all comes down under the umbrella of the feel the feel you know you got to have the feel and this tempo and steady you know so i learned a lot from from playing with iomi you know you yeah know, you know, wow <laughs> big chords just right in the pocket you know that guy's a god yeah he is Maybe. a god Thanks for doing the show, man. I really thank you, Dean. And uh, nice talking to you. And check out Tuesday, 4 p.m. Facebook, Finney Apathy Official. Yeah, everybody get down on that Facebook and uh, watch his drum lesson and jams. And uh, and also check out the new Last in Line record coming out, Jericho. It's uh, they got a, a single out right now, Ghost Town. It's fantastic. And uh, thank you again, man.
Ah, thanks, Daniel. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks See for you, listening. All, All right. right.